pick and choose and toss aside the things you don't like. So you're inventing your own version of Christianity. So why not just chuck it aside and go ahead and invent your own secular moral system? You keep talking about how we don't have limits. I have plenty of limits. And we live in a society that has plenty of limits. As Daryl's already pointed out, most societies have limits. You keep going to this slippery slope thing of, well, if there is no you know, Ten Commandments or Jesus or whatever, then you've got no limits. You'll just run around raping and killing people. Well, that's already demonstrably false. And there have been multiple studies that, that actually investigate the correlation between the religiosity of a society and its societal health. And there is always a strong negative correlation. The more atheists the society, the better they score on societal health factors from everything from teenage pregnancy rates to STDs to happiness to wealth to, to murder, uh, murder rape. rape to um, health care. Now, go out and do some actual research that contradicts this, and then you might have a case for your assertion that I think you'll live a better life if you're... No, you won't. There's no, there's no, dem there's no evidence to demonstrate this. This is wishful thinking. Just as you, not only have you gone and said, well, I'll pick and choose what I want, you've done it in a way that where you're just trying to support your own wishful thinking. And until you actually come up with evidence, and until you demonstrate that you care about the truth, we don't really need to waste any more time on it. And I guess we won't. We got Christopher in coming. How are you? I'm doing good. How about you? Fine. Okay. Um, I'm going to get to this point real quick, but first of all, I've got to say the uh, sex thing that you guys have been talking about, the first thing that came to mind was very Orwellian in nature. Yeah. Just the fact that it they're trying to hold everything from you, make you think about everything that you do, all that. God's got a spy camera in your bedroom. He's like yeah. a colossal pervert. Well, that's what God is. Isn't Jesus, he? He's a big brother. Jesus is a voyeur, and he's watching you all the time. That's what I was taught real early in my life. It's the craziest idea. but And ceiling yeah. cat, too. Yeah, ceiling cat. There you go. <laughs> that, that's exactly why I came to the thought of George Orwell and the yeah. uh, Big Brother scenario. Yeah, right. But anyway, my question was, a friend of mine, she's, she's kind of a deist with tints of Christianity. Now, she's one step away from this uh, realization that there is no God, or at least in the atheist sense, that there is no proof of this. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that she's really, that's really holding her there is the fact that she's petrified of there being no afterlife, of there being nothing after this. She's got this fear that just grips her and keeps her from looking at the scenario logically. Well, let me, let me just throw out here. What you're describing is what I call a death neurosis. We're all afraid of death. That's a fairly yeah. normal thing. You're, you're, as sentient human beings that have a consciousness, we are concerned about the end of our life. And there's nothing wrong with that. What happens in death neurosis is somebody is, is, is created, there's a heightened fear of that death brought, brought about, oftentimes through religion. I don't know, you didn't mention religion with this woman. Is that, is that the case? Uh, she claims to be a Seventh-day Advent oh, Adventist, okay. but um, it's but, very light. She acknowledges that a lot of the stories in the Bible are metaphor. Mm -hmm. They aren't taken but literally. But she, was, she was raised... Human seven, hands made it and all that. She, she was raised Seventh-day Adventist? Hmm? She was raised a Seventh-day Adventist? Yeah, her father's a minister. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, it, it, fundamentalist I churches and Seventh-day Adventists are very fundamentalist are very big on death, fear of death. You're going to hell, and you're going to burn in hell, and all that sort well, of stuff. Well, the it thing creates... is, she doesn't believe in hell. Oh, she, no. As I said, she's, a, she's mostly a deist with hints of the Christianity. But what I'm suggesting is, she was taught this at the age of five to seven years old. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, you acquire this infection that I call the God virus at five to seven years old. It is pre-conscious. It's long before what, what I call the rational immune system is, is mature enough to evaluate this information. So this information was poured into her head about her going to hell, she's a bad person, original sin, I mean, you name it, there's tons of things that Christians get dumped on when they're five to seven years old, plus or minus a few years there, and it's pre-conscious. So she's dealing with a neurosis that goes right into the most deepest part of her consciousness and something she was not aware of when, it, when she was being taught 
And, and Seventh-day Adventists are pretty vicious about this in many ways. They're, it's a pretty strong fundamentalist principle on, um, that they follow there. So what I'm saying is you're probably not going to get her out of it. She may say she's a deist, but... No, I, I basically gave her that label because she acknowledges that a lot of the Bible isn't, right, right. isn't the hand of God. Until she sits down with somebody with some professional skills around this. Yeah. Uh, and a non-theist, don't go to a Christian counselor because they'll, unfortunately they will reinforce it. Even inadvertently, they'll still reinforce it. Until she does that, she's probably not going to get over this. It's, a pretty, it's pretty deeply embedded. If you think about it, uh, you learned your, your language about that same time. You know, we were learning our language from the time we were two, one or two years old up until about 10. And think how deeply language is embedded in you. Now let's say at the age of whatever she is, 30 years old, 40 years old, we say, now we're gonna, we want you to learn Chinese. And we want you to learn Chinese as well as you just learn, as you learned English. It would be almost impossible for her to do. Very few people could do that. Well, that's what you're asking her. You're saying, we want you to unlearn this deeply embedded God virus that you learned at five to seven before you were even aware of it. It's just almost as hard as learning a new language, just unlearning it sometimes. Or, or yeah, in some I cases, haven't been pushing it on her. I've just been, you know, letting her see some of the clips from shows like this, listening to a little bit of Richard Dawkins, things like that, Try, she, trying to make her think logically, uh, just step by step. I'm not pushing anything on her. I'm just saying, hey, look at this. This I think you would find interesting. And that's a good way to do it. The more you push, the more you're likely to give her the wrong, push her back into where you don't want her to go. Yeah, and going back to the language thing, in some cases it's a little bit like uh, not, not even just learning another language, but trying to convince somebody that a word that they've been using since they were three either means something entirely different from what they think it means or that it's not actually a word that it has no meaning, that nobody else has actually used this. That's, it's along those lines. It ties back to something I said before and something I've heard somebody else say, in that religion basically gives you a sickness and then tries to provide you the cure. And in this case, when we're talking about death, um, they're exploiting something that's going to happen to everybody. And they've invented a sickness called, called after death. And they're providing a cure for it. And so the people who, who begin to have problems and, and, and doubt or eventually reject their religion because the rejection of that religion does not provide a cure for this mythical after death, the only way around that is to finally get them to realize that after death doesn't exist, that, they've been, that they were never infected with the disease that they were trying to be given a cure for uh, in, as anything other than, you know, mental. But. Good question, and sure. um, good luck to you and her. Thank you very much, and I want to thank you guys for doing what you do. It was actually one of the reasons I became an atheist recently myself. Thanks right, a lot. Good. Have a great day. Okay. Thanks much. We're uh, running, running short on time, but we're going to get to another call in just a second. As a reminder, after the show's over, we get together for dinner at Threadgills. Well, I'll be down there. 301 West Riverside Drive. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to join us. And we've got Matthew in Ireland. Uh, hi. Hi, hi, Matthew. Uh, how are things? Um, I would just like to... Um, a point um, uh, on, on the absolute fallacy of the argument that that um, atheist was making. And, and it's always the same rhetoric over and over that, you know, uh, religious morals are better and uh, um, how can an atheist, you know, uh, live um, without uh, having, have, having these kind of morals? And I know this, and, and, and this is from debates and from, even from the um, a political uh, propaganda because there's, there's always an um, ultranationalist uh, trait when they, when they uh, advocate religious moral as they say, listen, you know, if you're religious, you're being a noble citizen, and if you're not, uh, and, and if you don't adhere to religious morals, then, then you're not, you know, a, a normal, ideal citizen. And, uh, and it just, and, and their morals, re religious morals, are always a fundamentalists. Yes, and, you're uh, right. They're always uh, 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 onto the extreme. And, and one of the absolute uh, flaws, and, and I, I think it's very misleading, that, that they do is uh, when they uh, indoctrinate uh, children, which is a very sophisticated form of abuse, is that they tell them that they're not allowed to question uh, their morals and that if they so, so, so much as they step outside those uh, parameters of these so-called, you know, holy morals, that immediately, you know, immediately uh, that's it, uh, that they're lost. And also, and yeah... Hey, I, Matthew, made, can, uh, I uh, can I interrupt you? 
Matthew, yeah. you're from yeah, Ireland. Yeah. You're from Ireland, right? Uh, well, or, well, uh, originally I'm from Malta, but uh, I'm, I'm in Ireland at the moment. Excellent. Well, I just got back from Ireland. I was just there in uh, in, July, in July. Are you a member of of Atheist Ireland there? Yes, yes. I'm actually awesome. a member. Awesome. Great, great. Well, you've had some pretty bad system, um, issues going on with the priests there in Ireland. I'm sure you're familiar with some of that. Oh, yes. And the, oh, indo yes. And the indoctrination of children that allowed priests to get away with some pretty heinous crimes. Yes. What I find interesting, and I just wanted to use this as a jumping off point for part of what you were saying there, is I find it interesting that no, almost no priests have been convicted of any of these crimes and that the Catholic Church allowed the, uh, would only allow the reports to come out as long as no one was convicted. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with that, I'm sure, right? Oh, oh, oh yes, and, uh, and actually, uh, and uh, picking up on that, the most horrific thing is that until 40 years ago, the Catholic Church could literally, literally had control over the, uh, the uh, authorities here, over the uh, Gordi, like no one, not, 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 not even a police officer would dare question what a priest would say. Right. If, for example, a local parish priest, if, if a woman uh, ha wanted to uh, buy, uh, purchase um, a contraceptions over the counter, they had to sub get a subscription from the parish priest. The word of a clergyman was, uh, was even was higher than that of a civil servant or whatnot. And also, yeah. uh, uh, there was the issue um, of the Magdalene uh, uh, Convenance, where these uh, so-called, you know, sinners, you know, women, were just uh, thrown in there. And it was just horrific. And, uh, and yes, uh, it, it's until this very day, uh, uh, there is hardly any uh, political party, uh, any, uh, any uh, figure whatsoever who, who, who says, look, you know, we, uh, uh, this has to be dealt to it. Um, uh, you know, through the system, it's it, the, the Catholic Church in, in, in most parts of Europe, especially the parts which are more, you know, um, where, where the uh, church and the state separation yeah. is very uh, now, uh, where the church is literally a, a allowed to police itself. The thing that and I was uh, the thing that I was most uh, concerned about when I was in Ireland, and I spoke there. I, evidently, you weren't the, you weren't in this group when I was speaking at Atheist Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. But what I was most concerned about is, is the, the amount of imposition the Catholic Church still has over the state in Ireland. I think you're describing it very well. It's interesting, though, in the United States, we have the opposite problem. We're trying to keep the church out of politics. In yeah. Ireland, you're trying, to get the church, you're trying to get the church out of politics. It's like the opposite problem. It's got the same result, unfortunately. But, uh, but you guys are doing some great stuff, and I noticed that the Irish... Parliament, the Dial, I guess you call it, um, yes. passed uh, a civil a civil marriage law in mm -hmm. uh, in January, and that was or July, yeah. I guess. That's pretty amazing mm -hmm. for a dominantly Catholic uh, or a, a yeah. culture, for sure. It's also ironic uh, that they recently ba uh, passed this ridiculous um, a blasphemy legislation oh. where, uh, where yeah, where people can be f fined, as, you know. <laughs> um, a ridiculous fine for you know uh, for um, for uh, six, apparently yeah, speaking six, out against the morals of society you know so on and so 25, forth. Twenty-five thousand euros and six months in prison for blasphemy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And on yeah. and on that note, Matthew, I'm sorry, but I got to let you go because we are just almost completely out of time. But we appreciate the call. And <laughs> and I oops, I, I'll go ahead and we, we literally we have like one minute, so I'll give you like a couple a few seconds to to make sure your website uh, gets addressed. Yeah, I just like people to take a look at recoveringreligionists.com. And, uh, and look at, at the opportunity. Maybe you could start a group in your area. So that would be the main thing I'd like to, 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 to plug, if you will. All right. And there'll be more information. You can always email tv at atheist-community.org to get a hold of us, and we can give you more information about it. There's the list of the crew right there who make the show possible and get here early and fix all the technical problems, especially when I spill water that almost destroys microphones and things like that. We will have a show next week, and that'll be the last show of the year. We'll be off for two weeks and then returning um, in January. And you can check the website, www.atheist-experience.com, for information about the schedule and who's coming up and when